while the, the kids are heading down, let me uh, appeal to our church body. Life Action is coming in a couple of weeks. How many of you have been here for a Life Action Revival? Um, we're excited. They, uh, they do an awesome job, and we're ready for them to come. They were supposed to come last year, but uh, due to all the you know, things going on with COVID and whatnot, um, they, uh, we, we, we decided to postpone it. So uh, we're still in need of, uh, Lori, how many? Five houses? Five? Six? Six? Six homes uh, to open up for, for some of the crew, some of the team that's coming in. Um, so if you have a, a spare bed or two, um, and you would be hospitable, and um, they would love to be able to stay with you. Usually it's a couple, either two guys or two gals, um, that would come and stay for a week. It's going to be Friday to Friday the 10th through the, whatever that, 17th, I guess. Um, so anyway, Lori, why don't you stand up, Lori, let everybody see you. And uh, did everybody get a good look at Lori? You got okay. Um, she uh, she's the one who's kind of putting together all our host homes. So, if uh, you would be able and or willing, either one, able or willing. If maybe you're not willing yet, but you're able, uh, maybe the Lord will make you willing. Um, but uh, see, Lori, she would love to get together with you about uh, what that might look like to host a couple of uh, the team members for that week. Um, do we still need a couple cars, John, Ricky? John Ricky, John Ricky. I don't know if he's John Ricky's in the room. I once the room fills up, I can't tell who's where. Uh, okay, so I think we were still in need of a couple cars too. So if uh, if you got a car laying around that you don't mind uh, somebody driving for the week, uh, we could use a couple more cars as well. All right. So uh, <laughs> today is an awesome day. Would you agree? Um. You know, we, we do baptism every month. We plan on, a, on baptism every month. Um, and, you know, most months we have uh, a baptism or two or three or so. Um, but, uh, JC, I'm just I'm super excited to see what God's doing in your life. Um, you, you, I know that you are the subject of many prayers uh, and the result uh, of a lot of faithful prayer. And uh, what, what we are looking for always um, is transformation. Amen? I mean, this is what uh, it means to be a Christian. It's what it means to be a believer is that there is a transformation that happens initially that somehow or other, you know, and, and there's a mystery that's, that's involved in this, that somehow a, a human being uh, becomes aware of uh, the mysteries of God, they, they, they are enlightened to the truth. The, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, um, but the word is preached, spoken, lived out, declared, testified to by somebody, and then the power of prayer uh, by many faithful people um, then results in somebody saying, you know what, I need Jesus. Without him, I'm lost. Amen. Amen. And uh, there's a transformation, and then that transformation that happens in that moment, you know, is not done and over with. How many of you know that by experience? How many of you are still being transformed as, as we're going along, okay, and we're, we're in that process? How many of you have taken a couple steps back in your transformation process and uh, are looking for a little bit of help to kind of get back on track and get moving down the road again? And uh, one of the things that uh, we have to understand is that the Word of God is what is needed to continue in the transforming process and power in a person's life. It's the Spirit of God. It is faith in Jesus, but there's this, this renewal that happens in our minds that it has to continue, and it has to continue throughout the rest of our life. Um, it's not just a one-time thing that I accepted and, okay, I'm done trans being transformed and I'm all good. Because your mind 
is broken, <laughs> okay? Uh, I hate to alarm you, but uh, the, the reality is that uh, you, you thought a lot of wrong things, you believed a lot of wrong things, you did a lot of wrong things, you were taught by well-meaning people, even in Christian homes, okay? I'm one, raised in a Christian home, and uh, didn't learn everything I needed to learn throughout my growing up years I, I, because I had my own opinions. Does anybody else have an opinion about anything? I've always been a little bit opinionated or a lot of bit. And here's what we're dealing with right now. We have a world. controlled by unbelieving people, okay? Where, where are they getting their direction from? Majority? Majority rule? Or their own opinion? What they think is right for themselves, for, you know? And somebody said it, and I, this is true, um, there is an enemy, his name is Satan, and he has an influence in this world. Okay? And here's what we have to understand. I just, I really need you to grasp this. All the different opinions and uh, ideas of what people should do, they want you to do, how they want you to act, how they want you to feel, Okay, the agenda that they come with, um, much of it, if not almost all of it, from politics to media, okay, is not God's direction according to his will and his way and his word. The difference for a believer and, and especially, I hope, for a church, is that we, we are not persuaded. This is going to make some people mad, okay? We're not persuaded by political correctness, okay? We're not, we're not going to do what the majority wants us to do. Our agenda as a Church, people ask me, what's your position on a lot of different stuff? What does the Bible say? If it says something clearly about it, that's our position. And if it doesn't, then we have to interpret some biblical principles. And we have to come to a point of conviction. And this is what we are spiritually discerning, okay? As a church body and then as believers individually, we understand this. This is how uh, it works. We're, we desire to be biblically minded about everything. What does God want? We're going to come to our decisions based on what we believe God is directing us to. Sometimes it goes right in the face of what the culture and society says. Okay? Sometimes it, it uh, is so uh, obviously... Uh, counter-cultural that we get a lot of hate mail about that. We don't follow what the world wants. Sometimes uh, two different churches can come to two different conclusions and, and they're both trying to understand what God's will is in a matter. Okay, We got masks and vaccines and all this stuff. You, I'm going to tell you my heart, okay, and um, try not to, I'm not trying to be opinionated about this. this I, I want to tell you what I believe the scripture would lead us to. The Bible doesn't have a specific word on that. So we have to come to a place where we understand what God's will is based on a conviction of, and what we understand to be a biblical principle or a conviction. And maybe I'll get fired over this. I don't know. But here's what I'm going to tell you. 
we believe in personal liberty. Okay? And, and what that means is that the Holy Spirit living in an individual who is a believer has the ability, according to God's word, to interpret scripture for themselves to understand his will in their life. Okay? And so we have leaders and we have pastors and teachers, um, but we have a priesthood of all believers, which means that you're responsible for you. And we will do the best that we can to come around each other and support and encourage each other, protect each other, but our goal is spiritual growth and biblical conviction. And we may not be politically correct. So how do you get transformed by the renewing of your mind? Uh, let's talk about what it means to think biblically. Can we do that? Let's stand as we read God's word this morning. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, starting in verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You, you, you guess what? <laughs> That's where we all have been. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purposed, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And Father, that rejoicing that you declare in your word, Lord, is, is for those who have been transformed by the renewing of their mind, who have received your word, and understood, Lord, where it directs us to, which is to Jesus Christ. Our hope is in you. Our trust is in you. Our faith is in you. And we, give, we put all uh, that we have on the line. Our lives, Lord, are yours to, to do with what you want, Lord. And as we come to these places where uh, we're being challenged, Lord, even tested, God, I pray that your church, your people... Uh, God would uh, come to that place of, of absolute firm conviction and faith where we know that beyond the shadow of a doubt, you're in control and we're going to follow your will no matter what it looks like, no matter what the, the consequences are, God, because we know that you have our hands, uh, our lives in your hands, Lord. Our eternity is, is yours and we have a great potential to live differently so that the world might see uh, Jesus Christ lived out in our hearts, minds, and lives and hear that word that can save them. God, help us never to stop, forsake, or, or be uh, challenged, Lord, to, to uh, relent, Lord, in speaking the truth, living the truth, glorifying you in all that we do. God, we give you all praise. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be people who think biblically. And more than that, Lord, that we would live biblically for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, uh, one of the reasons, you know, uh, that we need to uh, think biblically is because you just, you didn't get... Uh, biblical thoughts in your head when you were born. I don't know if you know that. Um, you were born, and this is something that people, they, they don't like to hear this, okay? But you were born lost. <laughs> You're sinful. You're a sinful creature. 
Um, and uh, all through Scripture, we see that this is the, the state of, of a human being, that it has to be transformed. We were born once, physically speaking, but spiritually speaking, when we come to know Jesus Christ, we're born again. And I've said this before, I'll say it again just for clarity. Uh, there's no such thing as a Christian who is not born again. People will talk about born-again Christians and some other kind of Christians. All Anybody who's a Christian, okay, who's really a Christian, is born again. Spiritually, you have come alive. And the, what happens is that something changes from your natural state of, of living in a confused, misled, uninformed, or misinformed state to understanding what God's will and, and His Word says. The Word of God comes alive in your heart and your mind and brings faith. But Romans says um, that although they knew God, and we're talking about the world here, okay, the entire world has a concept that there's a God. I, I believe that Scripture tells us this, and I believe it by experience, that everyone understands deep down that all that exists didn't just happen by accident. There's something behind it. And then a lot of people um, would call themselves atheists, okay, and they want to deny that. Why do they have to deny anything? Because there's, there's a hole in their heart that tells them that there, there's eternity, that when I leave this planet, I'm going somewhere, and I can try to convince myself that I'm just going to disappear. But we know that that's, that's not true. So although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so what happened 2,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago um, and beyond is that people, instead of honoring God who is invisible, uh, they made little statues of things, thinking that if they could, they could resemble or, or, or somehow image a god and then give it glory, that, that gods, you know, these different gods would, would bless them and, and make them fertile for having children or, or give them crops or make them wealthy or keep them healthy or whatever it was. And so people worshipped all these different, you know, false gods, these images. Now, what Paul is saying here in Romans about exchanging God, the glory of God for these images, we don't do that much anymore in the terms of like a statue. What we've replaced the statue with is ourselves. And much of humanity, most of humanity, um, has desired to be in the place of God. I'm God. I can do what I want. And this was the original sin between Adam and Eve in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was this idea that I'm going to make the decisions about what's right and wrong. Now, do you see that happening in our day? I'm going to choose what's right and wrong, and I'm going to force everyone to agree with me about what I'm saying is right and wrong, even if it is 100% in contradiction to what God has said, God must be wrong. And if God is wrong, then there must not be a God. We're God's. On the large scale, that's, what hap that's what's happening. But on the, on the minor scale in your own life, this is what happens when you decide to do what you know God has said is wrong. I'm going to make the decision about what is right and wrong and hope to get away with it. As a believer, you think, well, you shouldn't be doing that. Would you agree? But how many believers are still doing that? I believe in God, but I'm going to do what I want. And, you know, I was raised this way. And, well, that's just how your church interprets things. But, you know, I, I heard from this other pastor over here who said it was okay. So if I can just get some people to agree with uh, me on this issue. But we're, we don't care about that. What we want is to think biblically what God says in his word. Does his words declare this clearly or not? Well, how do you know? You're going to have to read it, aren't you? Don't take my word for it. Please, okay? Get into your own Bible. 
So Romans, it continues on here, and, and listen, I got a lot more to say here, but um, verse 28, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind, which basically means utterly sinful, okay, uh, to do what they ought not to be done. Uh, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, their gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. Okay, if you don't know the evil, just invent some more. Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval, hearty approval to those who practice them. They're saying, if we can just come to a place of majority where we have a club of people who agree that this is okay, then we will insulate ourselves from the truth. And what you see in the world is all of these things happening because we don't want to glorify God, acknowledge Him, or praise Him. And this is inherent in the human condition. I'm talking to people who are spending an hour of their, their week in a church worshiping God, and it is a challenge for even for you. Godly people, okay? It's a challenge for you to come to that place of obedience to say, God, your will be done, not mine. And every day, I have to continue to lay my life down at the altar. Romans 12 uh, tells us that we are a living sacrifice. Okay? Now, I said this to a couple of guys the other night, and it's not something I created. I, I didn't come up with this, but I thought it was pretty cool, pretty important for us to know. The problem with a living sacrifice rather than a dead sacrifice is that a living sacrifice can crawl off the altar. <laughs> that's, that's a problem. Every day I can choose to glorify God or not. I can choose to read his word and, and spend time with him or and do my own thing. I can. How many of you... No, I don't want to ask that. <laughs> Mike. Well, I was going to say, how often... Do you find yourself, even as a, a committed believer, um, skipping your Bible reading, skipping your time with the Lord? Oh, I'm too busy. I got up late. I, I got to get breakfast and get going. I'll do it later, right? And before you know it, you know, not only has a day gone by, but a week's gone by or a month's gone by. And you look at, you know, I'm still a believer. I, trust, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. But I've spent zero time with God over the last month. Does that ever happen? Or are you just rushing through it? Okay, I, yeah, I read my verse or two or chapter, and I spent a little time in prayer. God, please be with me today. You know, amen. And we're just kind of rushing through, and, and the transformation is barely happening. We're, we're, we're asking God for a blessing, but we're not giving God the sacrifice of, of our hearts and minds. And uh, here's what the Bible tells us, that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And here's the next thing. Jesus piggybacks on that, and he says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You want to know where your heart is, okay, what's coming out of your mouth? What's coming out of your mouth on social media? That's reflective of what's in your heart. Is it good? Or is it angry? Is it, is it insulting? Is it foul? Is it dismissive? Is it glorifying to God? Or is it um, cursing people? You know, James says that you cannot praise God and curse people who are made in his image. It's like salt water coming out of a fresh spring. It's just not possible which means that there's got to be some transformation of the heart going on. Amen? You're not giving me an amen, because why is that? It's hard stuff. We need to be transformed. I'm, okay, I have two pages here, and I've 
I'm only this far. <laughs> I'll go faster. All right. So what's the, what's the deal? The heart is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah 17, 9, desperately sick, and nobody can understand it. But James says, James 1, 18, that God chose to give us new birth through the word that we might be a sort of first fruits of God, all that he created. So here's what happens. The word of God, you put it in you, and it's going to create something out of you. You put it in your heart, and it's going to transform that heart. Now you don't have to try to watch your mouth or really control yourself because what's happening is that there's an internal transformation of the heart so that what comes out is the natural overflow of the good things that God is putting in there. Okay, so benefits of being transformed here by the word. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Anybody been down a crooked path? (laughs) You're on the straight path now, which means that you don't have to double back. You're not losing time. The, The shortest distance between two points is a what? It's a straight line. The crooked path means, man, I keep messing up, I'm going back, I'm, I'm losing. You submit your, your will to the Lord and he will make your path straight. Psalm uh, 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When do you strip, trip and, and stumble? It's in the dark. He's going to make, the, what, what, here's, here's really ultimately what this is about. What's your purpose? Why are you here? You realize that you're here for a reason. Most of us are going through our days, just kind of, you know, biding time, getting through our work, going home, hoping not to get into an argument with the wife, (laughs) get to bed, do it all over again. What am I here for? The word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light for my path. It says, this is why I exist, to glorify God, to point people to him. We're all going to live and work and and, uh, die one day. But for the short time that I'm here, hopefully I've directed somebody to know the Lord. Because you're going to live forever. One way or another, somewhere or other, you're going to live forever. You want to direct people to heaven? Or, I'll tell you what, you are directing people one way or another. Are you not? Okay, I'm getting preachy. Uh, Luke. 11.28 11.28 says, blessed are those who hear the word and obey it. It means your life is happy. How many of you want to be happy? That's what that word means. Your life is full of joy and supernatural influence and power in your life. Blessed by God. Um, John 8.51 tells us, and this is the best part, very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. You want to live forever? You've got to get that word in your heart. So how does this happen? Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought, make it obedient to Christ. What that means is that God has instilled in, um, it's, a, it's a principle he's instilled in, in, in his creation, Uh, It's his promise. It's his guarantee. He says, if you will repent, I will forgive. It's his nature to forgive, but he requires that we repent. And so immediately, you ever think a wrong thought? You ever have a really bad attitude or have something just come across your mind that's just wrong and you know it's wrong and, and you're trying to hold your tongue so that you don't say the wrong thing to that person, right? When these things happen and you don't catch it in time and you say that wrong thing or you think that wrong thing, it says we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It means that I can repent as soon as it happens. I'm sorry, God. I do this all the time. That was a wrong thought. I should not have thought that. I should not have been that way. I should not have even felt that way. And you just capture that moment and you say, God, I'm sorry. And immediately I believe in the promises of scripture. Scripture says he will forgive. I don't live with that. Oh man, I'm so bad. No, I'm, (laughs) I gave it to God. I'm done with it. 
Wouldn't that feel good just to kind of get those things? And then what happens as you do that more and more regularly, then you begin to not have to do it as regularly. It's a kind of a cool thing that begins to happen. You actually have a transformation in your mind that you're not thinking those things anymore. You're not saying those things anymore. Your mind is being transformed. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, good, pleasing, perfect will. Now, I'm trying to allow the Holy Spirit to take his word and transform not just my heart, but my mind. What am I thinking about? Here's Philippians 4, 8. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, ho- lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about those things. And I'm going to admit to you that over the last year and a half, um, I think I have become increasingly negative. Anybody else? Frustrated? Okay, a little defensive. You got people who have agendas and they want their agenda to be your agenda. And some of you are maybe in a similar situation that I'm in, in a leadership position where people want you to agree with them. And they're mad when you don't. And I don't. <laughs> always. You can't please everyone. And we live in a people-pleasing culture. People want to, to be, you know, I keep using the term politically correct, but that, that, that's just a symptom of our culture. People want you to just go along with whatever the, the, the majority rule is and not have your own opinion. And when you have an opposing opinion, then now we're in a battle. And I've gotten kind of negative about this, and and I was praying about this just the other day, and I realized the Scripture would lead me to believe and understand that I can choose to be joyful. I can choose that. And I'm starting to try to do that. Okay? It's a process. But it's, okay, God, I got first world problems. Our lightning struck our system, and we've been working all week trying to make sure we had video camera or screen, you know, projector for, for our Sunday morning. Been working on that all, all week, you know, frustrated. I hate technology. first world problems, you know, like, oh, there's a mandate, and what's the church going to do? We're going to require a mask? Uh, First world problem, like, but here's the deal, you wear a mask if you want to wear a mask. That's our understanding, okay? And some people don't like that. They want us to require a mask. We're not going to require, we never did require a mask. We didn't require a mask Last year, we had we recommended it for a short time. But here's the deal, is that these are, I mean, you look at what's happening in Afghanistan, okay? We have a family in the church just this weekend who lost a, a seven-year-old granddaughter in a car accident. And we, yeah, we got, we got problems, but... I'm a, I'm a frustrated and upset about something that's not life-altering. And most of the stuff that we're frustrated and upset about and up in arms about, first world problems, okay? And we need to give God glory and we need to make sure that we are not losing our witness as Christians because we're frustrated. So how do we do it? quickly. Read it. (laughs) Okay. The Bible tells you, we do not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You got to get it into your brain, into your heart. You have to familiarize yourself with it. There's no easy way around this. Okay. 
I wish you could just lay it on your pillow and it just sink into your brain as you sleep. Okay, it doesn't happen. Okay, you got to read it. You got to spend time every day. So read a chapter, two, three, or four. Okay, four chapters uh, of reading in the Bible only take you, for the average reader, I'm an average speed reader, 20 minutes. You got 20 minutes to, to read the Bible? If you spend 20 minutes a day reading the Bible, you'll pretty much read it in a year. And yet, how many people have read the Bible in a year? Praise the Lord. We don't, we're not doing that. So you, but you got to read it. And, and it's complicated. I know there's so much in here. It's, it's a lot. 66 books. Okay? And there are reading plans. We got all those resources back there. Get a reading plan. Get a devotional. Get a, a study Bible. We got tons of stuff for you, but, but make sure you're reading it. Secondly, you got to understand it. Sower in the Soils says, uh, this is Matthew 13, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. And here's what's happening, I believe. When a person, okay, you're here. Everybody, everybody, if you're here, raise your hand. Okay, you're here. Some of you are not here. Okay, here's what happens. Um, I'm proclaiming the word of God. Some of you are understanding it. You're like, yeah, I understand that. I get that. Now, here's what understanding really is, though. I'm going to do something about this. I don't just agree with it. I'm going to apply it to my life. So the hard path are the people that say, I hear it. I'm not going to respond to that. I don't agree with that. I'm not going to do that. So what's going to happen is you're going to leave here having heard the word and Satan's going to come along and he's going to take that word out of your life and it's going to make no difference to you. And you're going to keep going on your way and your heart's going to continue to be hard and you're going to have moms, dads, and uncles, and aunts, and maybe kids and friends praying for you, hopefully softening up that soil so that perhaps maybe next time the word gets sown in your heart, maybe you're ready to say, you know what, I need, I need to do something with that. Understanding means I'm going to obey it. It says, as for the one sown in rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. So yes, I believe, cool, I agree. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, they quickly fall away. What that means is, I get it, I like it, but as soon as times get tough, I'm going to doubt it. God, is he good? Why did this happen? Why did my kid, you know, have this problem? Why did I have a health issue? Why did I lose my job? Why? God just must not be too good, so I'm, I'm out. So that's the, the people who are, the word is sown, they're hearing it, and it sounds good at first, but when it gets tough, they get going. And number three says, for uh, what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, proves unfruitful. So what happens is you got one group of people who hear the word, yeah, it sounds cool, but bad times happen. And another group of people, yeah, it sounds good, I think I like that, but then, you know, I'm only in it for when I can get out of trouble. As soon as I'm out of trouble, I'm out. How many? I mean, we have these experiences all the time. People who seem excited at first, bad times happen, they're gone. People who are in bad times hear the word, God lifts them up, and as soon as they get back on their feet, they're gone. Okay? I, I don't know if that's you or not. I'm just saying that's definitely a possibility. And then he says, for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it. Yes, God, I'm going to do that. And indeed, he bears fruit and yields. In one case, 100-fold, 60, and in other cases, 30. So it's just that willingness to respond. When God says, this is why every week, practically every week, we give what we call an altar call. What we're asking you to do is to respond to the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. If he's prompting you, because here's what I know. As soon as you leave this place and you go to lunch, it's like, what, what did the pastor talk about again? You know, I kind of liked it when he said that one thing. And, you know, inevitably, if I, if I say something personal, 
then people will always say, oh, well, yeah, I have. Yeah. But what we do with the Word of God a lot of times is it just kind of, yeah, that's, that's good, I agree, and then we don't do anything with it. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to God, which means today, okay, you hear the Word of God, and He's saying, I, I'm calling you to spend some time in the Bible. And you're thinking in your mind, I need to do that. Well, the altar call is this. Um, commit yourself to spending some time in the Bible, reading it, spending some time with the Lord in prayer, understanding it. Understanding means I'm going to meditate on it, I'm going to apply it to my life. James says this, James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word, so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. The greatest way for the word of God to actually make a home in your life is just to obey it. Amen? Here's what happens. You can memorize scripture verses and make and it make no difference in your life. You apply scripture and it becomes real to you. Doesn't mean don't memorize it, <laughs> but it ultimately means you better do what it's calling you to do. So here's uh, the last couple things. First John 2:14 says, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because uh, you know him who's from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. And I believe that uh, what God really wants is for us to be like those young men who the word of God lives in us. The problem that many people have is that this book is just simply a book on their shelf and they struggle to open it or read it and what God says he can and will do is that if you will receive it and let it change your heart then it actually becomes something in your heart it lives in you I don't have to sit around and try to memorize scripture it's actually coming out of me The Bible says that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. You want to be defended in your life? That's what this is. It's God defending you by his power. You want the, uh, some advancement in your life? You want some protection? You want some, some, some purpose in your life? It's the sword of the spirit. It's both offensive and defensive. And when it begins to live in you, then something begins to happen. So now I'm living in a world that is hostile to God, but I have a power <laughs> in me that is, won't be defeated. Amen? You got to put it in you. You got to let God take his word and change you. Transformation happens every day. Father, we thank you. You are willing to transform us, Lord. You, you don't give up on us. Uh, your word, you said, that never comes back without doing what you purposed for it to do. Lord, I know that your desire is that all should be saved, Lord, that none should be lost. That was your stated purpose. I know that your word has the power to pierce our hearts, to to sever even soul and spirit. Lord, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It can convict our minds of sin. It can encourage us when we need encouraging. It can change us, Lord, in an instant. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word right now, God, and, and Lord, would you please just um, make a difference somebody's life. Help us to make a commitment to getting it into our hearts, reading it diligently, praying over it, letting you convince us of your truth and your way so that we can be different. And the world would see that difference and be astounded. 
that we can be so firmly, lovingly confident in you. We love you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite you this morning to respond to the Lord. And uh, it may not be one of those um, days where the altar's uh, easy to get to. In your own heart, your response is between you and the Lord, but you may need to do something physically to say, yes, I'm going to do what God is calling me to do. Raise your hand where you're at. You can do that. But say, yes, God, I'm going to do what you're calling me to do. If he's calling you to the altar, then that's an act of obedience. But I want to invite you, if you need to respond to the Lord for the first time, say, God, I need you in my life. I, I'm lost without you. We're here to pray for you. We're here to help you to understand what that commitment means. I'd love to spend some time at the altar. It's kind of loud. We'll leave you know, after service, and we can go talk about that if you want to know more. Amen? Let's stand and sing.